I'm actually very surprised to be standing here as your keynote speaker because this is all true. Uh, Asif uncle told me that I was not your first choice. Now I love Muslim uncles, they operate on two, two efficiencies, blunt and very blunt. Uh, Asif uncle called me up last week, he said, Beta, we first reached out to Hassan Minaj. And he said no. And I'm like, then you went to me? He goes, no, then we went to Fareed Zakaria. And he said no. And I'm like, then you went to, no, no, Sanjay Gupta. He said no. I love Mindy Kaling. I asked her, she said no. And then Ali Velshi. So I said, okay, I'm not too offended, elite group of people. And I said, after all of them said no, uncle, you came to me. He goes, no, beta, then we went to Imran Khan. I'm like, the prime minister of Pakistan, I love him, yes. And then I said, after him, he goes, the 1992 Pakistan cricket team. I'm like, after them, he said, the cast of Hum Safar, fantastic show. And I'm like, after that, he goes, the Shalimar owner restaurant. I love their tikka. After all of them said no, ladies and gentlemen, I am here as your last ditch, desperate keynote speaker for Salam. The bar is very, very low tonight. Um, I have a speech here, it's pretty interesting. He, uh, I asked Asif Ankal, I got 30 minutes, what do you want me to do? He goes, we just, we just need the money. You just need 30 minutes, talk about Muslims in the media. I'm like, that's it? He goes, just don't be depressing. So that's it, that's all I have to do. That's all he has me to do. Muslims, media, 30 minutes, don't be depressing. All right, here we go. Let's see if I can accomplish this goal in the next 30 minutes. I'm gonna tell you a quick story about the power of stories Muslims being in the media, and how, inshallah, it could positively affect America. You guys with me? All right. There's a great quote by a Jewish-American poet called Muriel Rukeyser. She's the daughter, she was the daughter of Jewish immigrants. This is the quote. The universe is made of stories, not of atoms. I'll repeat this. The universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And if there's one wise thing I say today, there might be only one thing. If you aren't telling your story, your story is always being told to you by others. And if you aren't writing your story, your story is always being written for you by others. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself for the sake of narcissism and vanity in honor of our President Trump. Because if he can do it, I can do it. I will not be talking about toilets. You guys been following the news? Yes, that's our president. He will make America great again, a man who talks for five minutes about toilets in the White House. The bar is very low for some people in America. Yes, thank you for applauding toilets. I appreciate that. Thank you, uncle. Uh, I am Mujahat Ali, a person uh, who wears makeup on television. Uh, I do not belong to the holy trinity of occupations because all Muslims know there are three occupations and only three occupations that get you into Jannat. The person who is the most holy in Islam after the angels is, of course, Doctor, mashallah, I like how the doctors were the first one. Like, doctor, doctor is the first one. Doctors, inshallah, are the first. After the angels, they get to heaven. Allah asks you, oh doctor, what do you want in life? You get to choose whoever is the hottest, the nine to 10 on the hotness scale. Doctors, mashallah. Uh, who is here single and looking for a spouse? One person in the back, I see you. You thought I wouldn't see you, I see you, marry a doctor. All right, if you're not lucky enough to be a doctor, who's number two? In mashallah, engineer, that's the engineering table. In the back. Did you guys notice this? When I said doctor, everyone's in the front. The maqam of the engineer is in the back. Mashallah, you get to Jannat after the doctors, not before the doctors. I'm sorry that you didn't get to marry a doctor, but it's okay. You seem to love your husband. It's okay. Mashallah, Allah is merciful. After the engineer, who's number three? Accountant. Account? No, not accountant. You are the only accountant, uncle, who makes that. Who's number three? Not lawyer. D teacher. Teacher? stuck for Allah. Who said teacher? Get out of this audience. Just get out. Just walk out. I'm disgusted by you, teacher. No, never teacher. In the history of ever, never. Number three is the dubious businessman who somehow makes a lot of money. And when you ask him, what does he do? He goes, import, export. And you say, what do you mean? He says, factory. And he said, what do you say? He says, don't ask more questions. Businessman. Who is fourth? Failure. That's everyone else. That's imam. That's teacher. That's writer, that's, that's everyone. So I'm, mashallah, the occupant of the fourth, the level of Jahannam, writer. And my parents decided to come all the way from Pakistan so that their only child will become failure. I'm the only child, yes, and I'm left-handed. My father came here, thank you. 
Thank you for laughing at my misery. 11% uh, of the population is left-handed. Who here is left-handed? Who's a jinn like me? Wow, that's a lot. You only do one thing with your left hand. Naseem, one thing only. I'm 39 years old and to this day, for those Muslims who don't understand, okay, Allah made us left-handed, okay? We can't help it. I'm a 39-year-old man. My aunt to this day, I eat with my right hand because they beat me into eating with my right hand. But sometimes when you take the biryani from the ladle, what do you do? You go with the left hand, right? I'm 39. My aunt to this day in a big packed party goes, mm, we only do one thing with the left hand. I'm like, thank you, Papo. Thank you for humiliating me in public. But I digress. Only son of Pakistani immigrants, my father came here after the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act. Who here came here after that? Anyone? Most Arab uncles, Desi uncles came here. That was the 1965 Nation uh, Immigration Nationality Act that removed the restrictive quotas that were placed in 1924. Because in 1924, the original invaders and rapists and criminals in the caravan weren't Muslims or Mexicans. They were Jews, Italians, and Catholics. Thanks to the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act, they got lifted and my father, who was a student in Karachi with his older brother, came here with nothing, worked a couple of jobs, made some money, went to graduate school. He goes back to Karachi, sees my mom. 11 days later, they get married because that's how they used to do it back in the day. That was pre-Tinder. They come here. They move to the Bay Area, Fremontistan, California, where I am their only son with Jahat Ali. They decide not to teach me any English because who needs English in the United States of America? They decide to name me Wajahat, to blend. I am their only child. Uh, they, I do not speak English. They drop me off at Child's Hideaway Preschool in Fremont where I only know three words of English. True story. Shut up, because my mother used to say shut up. Idiot, because my mother used to say shut up, idiot. And anyone who grew up in the 80s, there was a, sp a spaghetti commercial. Uh oh, spaghettio, remember that? So I was a fob, so I said, uh oh, pasgettio. Shut up, idiot, uh oh, pasgettio. Only Muslim kid. Only Desi kid, left-handed. We only do one thing with the left hand. They tried to convert me. I failed. I was also very healthy. Healthy means I was also very big boned. Big boned means I was also very mashallah. Mashallah, I was fat. And this is where you ask, how fat were you? How? Thank you for being alive. Thank you. Yes, how fat were you? I was so fat that back in the day at Sears, are there any Sears left? There's a couple of Sears. Okay. At Sears, there was a, a section for the healthy boys, and it was called Husky. And you, have to, you had to walk the mile of shame past all the other young boys section and go to the Husky pants section for the big boned kids. And the jeans, the Husky jeans on the right side of your butt in 96 times New Roman font, from space you could read Husky. So I was Husky, mashallah, left-handed, uh, shy, sick, Lentil stains on my shirt, three words of English, only Muslim, only Desi, I was a winner. I was very popular. However, I ended up graduating with an English major from UC Berkeley. I ended up marrying a doctor who was also the high school varsity cheerleader. Hashtag it gets better, takbir, Allahu Akbar. I love America. This is great country. All right, you guys still with me? Are you bored? Not yet, okay. I was shit, uh, the reason why I mention this is a lot of people say, oh, which I, you gave me that bio that was amazing. It, you know, I, if I was single, I could have gotten Rishtas off that bio. You made me sound like the most brilliant man on earth. A lot of people, especially young people, and Asif uncle said, inspire the youth. A lot of young people say, oh, you write for the New York Times, you're on CNN, I wish I could do it, who am I, I'm nobody. And I'm telling you this story because this is who I am. I grew up in the Bay Area, total dork, like, like MVP of dorks and super shy, and I couldn't speak to save my life, Tiga. Fifth grade, I'm at Harker, and they're about to kick me out of school because I was so sick. I had such terrible allergies, I had missed 32 days of school. And I had to get allergy shots every week, and I was on hardcore steroids. I finally got a doctor who didn't go to Kaiser. <laughs> Too soon, low blow. Saved my life, and I had to work my butt off to catch up with all my other schoolmates. My teacher, Mrs. Peterson from Kentucky, made us do an original short story. And she said, you have to write a one-page original short, short story. At this time, it was 1991. You guys remember the movie Robin Hood? So it was Kevin Costner playing Robin Hood, 
with an American accent, which was very strange. But his best friend, you remember who his best friend was in the movie? Morgan Freeman, playing a Muslim named Azim. And he was noble, and he saved his life. It was the first time we saw a Muslim, and he prayed in a way no Muslim ever did. We we're like, but that's okay, because you're awesome. And I decided to write my rendition of Robin Hood. The one-page story became a 10-page story. I took it to school, and Mrs. Peterson gave it an A++++. And she said, you have to recite the story just like this in front of your fifth grade homeroom class. And I said, Mrs. Peterson, I'm shy, I'm fat, I can't do it. She goes, shut up, fatty, go read the story. Something like that. I went and read the story, and for the first time ever, my fifth graders, and by the way, who here was fat growing up? This is a safe space, raise your hand. One, two, can I have a three, can I have a three, can I have a three, can I have a three? Over here, can I have a four? I know there's more, give me a four, 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 five. In the back, five, there are at least five, five, six. There's at least six form of six. Oh, you just outed your wife. Cold-blooded. You're sleeping on the couch. He literally was sitting behind his wife. He goes, Hur. Uncle, that is a man who plays with fire. Good luck. I pray for you. Can we do a prayer for that brother? Ya Allah, protect that man's life tonight. All right. So those six, I know there's more. Know that back in the day, growing up fat men being World War III every day in school, right? Remember that? Everyone used to make fun of us. You know, this guy's about to cry. <laughs> He's like, oh. Uh, there was no body positive images. There was no Dove soap commercials. Every day was pain, okay? So I'm just giving you an example. I was shy and everyone used to make fun of me. For the first time in my life, my fifth grade homeroom class gave me an applause. My Mrs. Peterson said, then there is a talent show coming up two weeks later in front of the upper class. Go and recite that story there. I'm like, I'm fat. I can't. She goes, shut up, fatty. I went and did it, and for the first time, the sixth graders and the seventh graders were in rapt attention as I read my 10-page story, and they gave me an applause. And right then, I realized I might have a superpower. I might be able to tell a story, and I could capture their attention. I took the story home to our home in Fremontistan. My father, Pakistani uncle, sitting drinking chai. My mother was in the kitchen. My father reads the story and goes, Beta, you have a talent. You should think about becoming a writer. My mom runs from the kitchen and goes, but first become a doctor. <laughs> this is a true story. True story, by the way. I got very lucky. I got very lucky that they always encouraged me. Fast forward, I end up going to uh, Bellarmine College Pre uh, Preparatory School, an all-boys Jesuit Catholic high school. Yes, I'm still Muslim by the time. Uh, and every semester, they try, to, they try to convert you into becoming a Catholic priest. So they teach you religion. Guess who got the highest grade every semester? Wajahat Ali, the Muslim. Followed by Kalyan Neelam Raju, the Hindu. Followed by Naveed Mustafavi, the lapsed Persian Muslim. And when Father Allender used to read the grades, you, you could just hear his Jesuit heart just crack just a little bit. And I used to be like the dorky Muslim kid. I'm like, I, I read that verse, I can tell you. And he's like, anyone other than Wajahat, tell me what Jesus said. And I'm like, I can tell you that story. But it was in, in high school where slowly but surely I got a little bit more confidence and there was an improv comedy troupe. And every year I'm like, I'm gonna try out for the comedy troupe. And finally that last year, my senior year, I said, I'll try out for it. I have nothing to lose. I tried out for it, I made it. I was the only Muslim who had ever done it. And mashallah, I did pretty well. It was the first time I started doing theater. I get into UC Berkeley. Anyone here from Berkeley? Anybody, anyone? That's, that's like a maybe? You wanted to go to Berkeley? That was amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that vote of confidence. This. He goes, UC Berkeley-ish, maybe. I go to UC Berkeley. It was 1998. And I remember as part of the Muslim Student Association on the side, when the Muslims weren't looking, I started a sketch comedy troupe. Because comedy is haram. Everything's haram. Saying everything is haram is haram. You're haram. I'm haram. He's haram. Everything's haram. Everything shirk and bidda, bidda and shirk, shirk, bidda, shirk, shirk, bidda. That's what it was for four years at UC Berkeley MSA. Hopefully things have gotten better. Uh, we did the first uh, improv comedy sketch troupe at UC Berkeley. It was called the Guad Squad, where we wrote and directed and produced our own sketch comedies. Okay? But I did it on the DL, because I was also a member of the Muslim Student Association. Interesting things happen. 9-11 happens. I'm 20 years old. I'm a senior. And I make the mistake of joining the Muslim Student Association instead of Indus, the Indian Student Association, where if I had joined Indus, I would have learned how to do Bhangra. 
But instead, I'm part of the MSA. I'm 20 years old, I'm a senior, I'm an undeclared major. Only child, left-handed, jinn. All right, two towers fall. And my roommate decides to put my email on the website for media contact. <laughs> awesome, I know, everything's awesome so far. It's UC Berkeley, it's the hub of activism. You know, people kind of recognize it for student activism. We did, our, we did the first protest before the war, anticipating the war. So guess who gets the call from national media as a 20-year-old? Wajhadli. No training thrown into the fire. And overnight, at the age of 20, undeclared major, I became the accidental activist and cultural ambassador of 1.7 billion people and 1,400 years of Islamic civilization, all right? And the interesting thing was, growing up in Bay Area, Fremontistan, California, the worst thing I was called was Gandhi, which is a compliment. And I remember, I'm like, thank you for calling me a pacifist world leader who helped overthrow 300 years of British imperialism and usher in three nation states. And like the racists were like, yeah, shut up, you're fat. Uh, but after 9-11, we became what? Terrorists, right? And by the time I was 20 years old, no one gave me training, and I was not only representing the Muslims who were terrified, because you guys remember the young, the young, the young folk, you, you don't remember. Things were crazy after 9-11. So much so that hijabis did not go to campus because they were terrified. So you gotta represent hijabis, you gotta represent the local community, and now you have to represent this thing called Islam on radio and television. And if you mess up, not only are you personally indicted and convicted, but 1.7 billion people are indicted, convicted, and sentenced by a nameless judge, jury, and executioner that always holds your patriotism and loyalty as suspect. And that's still the case. You have to condemn violent acts done by violent people you've never met in continents you've never visited. Unless, of course, he happens to be a Saudi who kills a bunch of people, and then King Salman calls Trump and says, hey, I'll pay you some money. Too soon? Too soon. On the drop of a dime, I was asked to be an expert on the following topics. Islam, Quran, Sharia, Prophet Muhammad, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Hamas, Hamas, Bollywood, Salman Khan of the Khan Academy, Salman Khan of Bollywood, and Omar Sharif, who is not Muslim. <laughs> that was a reference for the aunties. Being a Muslim Wikipedia was and is exhausting. It was and is exhausting. It was not a role I chose. I just wanted to play video games and, you know, pretend to talk to the pretty girl who I would never talk to because I was a Muslim dork. And I was asked then, as I'm asked now, why does Islam hate the West? And when I travel to Muslim-majority countries, you know what they see me as? Not as a Muslim, as an American. They ask me, why does the West hate Islam? And the whole time I'm asking myself, who is Islam and who is the West? And how come I've never met either of them? You guys still with me? Are you bored? All right, good. The interesting thing is that the image of this thing called Islam after 9-11, and I'm not making this up, especially in the media, it was called Rage Boy. You've seen Rage Boy. Rage Boy has appeared on newspaper covers. Rage Boy has appeared on magazine covers. Rage Boy has appeared as a meme. This is Rage Boy. By the way, I'm gonna fast forward. That was me, by the way. This is Rage Boy. You see Rage Boy? Yeah. Look at Rage Boy. Low angle shot, bearded and brown, foreign, angry. He's anti-woman, anti-deodorant, anti-KFC, anti-Semitic. Look at the women behind him. They're veiled, they're covered. This was the image of Islam. I'm not making this up. The media gave a term to this and they said, Rage Boy. He became a meme. 1400 years of Islamic civilization and 1.7 billion narratives reduced to this, all right? The funny thing is, is a bunch of journalists in England were like, who is this guy who they keep using for the image of Islam? And they found him. His name is Shaquille Ahmed Bhatt. He's from Kashmir, and this is how he looks. Hello. <laughs> Rage boy. Shaquille Ahmed Bhatt. Imagine that. His entire narrative, his personality reduced to this. When they asked him, how do you feel about being a stereotype, he goes, it, doesn't bother me, you guys could do what you want to do, I don't care. He was arrested over 300 times because the poor guy is in Kashmir, a Kashmir activist, and at that time that this photo was taken, he just wanted to get married. But it just shows you the power of images, the power of framing, the power of a narrative. 
Most of us know Shaquille Ahmed Bari. He looks friendly. Like, hello, I'll have some chai. Thank you. But he becomes this. Look at the difference. Stunning, right? And we're living in a situation now, I don't have to depress you, I won't depress you for long, you guys know this, where people think Obama is a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. If he is a Muslim, he's the worst Muslim of all time. He eats pork openly, drinks alcohol, says Jesus Christ is his savior, not a Muslim. But people thought he's Muslim, still think he's Muslim, and because they think he's Muslim, which he's not, they think he's what? Foreigner and anti-American. Anti-Sharia bills have come across the nation. We have people saying that the radical Muslim Brotherhood has infiltrated the Congress and every single Muslim institution. We have uh, the President of the United States of America promoted conspiracy theories that Muslims in New Jersey celebrated 9-11 and he has seen video of it. When you ask him to show the video, he does not provide the video because the video does not exist. And we have something called the Muslim ban. And meanwhile, in 2019, the FBI says we have hit an all-time record of hate crimes in the United States of America. And who is the big focus group? Jewish American groups, LGBT, and Muslims. Yet the number one domestic terror threat in America right now is white supremacist terrorism. In fact, the ADL said, I want to read this for you, that in 2018, almost all extremist-related murders in the US were committed by right-wing extremists. They counted 50 deaths. And 75% of those killings were committed by right-wing extremists who were white supremacists. Yet when Muslim terror suspects commit a crime, there is seven times as much media coverage. Seven times. And there is four times as much longer criminal sentences. If you aren't telling your story, your story is being told to you by others. All right, so here we go, it's 9-11. I'm sitting here, I'm 20 years old, the towers fall. I don't know what the heck to do with my life. I'm in a short story writing class, and my teacher is an African-American MacArthur genius, Ishmael Reed. And he says, I'm going to take you out of the class. I think he's going to yell at me because I've missed school for three weeks. He says, don't waste your time in a short story class. I think you're a playwright. You have good dialogue and characters. Uh, I'm black, and we've been through this for 400 years in this country. You guys are going to get a hazing and a beating for the next 10 years. He's talking about Muslims. He goes, the way we fought back is through art and culture. So I'm going to have you make me write a play. What are you again? I said, ah, oh, fat, what? He goes, no, ethnicity. I said, Pakistani Muslim. Write me a story about a Pakistani Muslim American family. You ever read Fences or Long Day's Journey in the Night or Death of a Salesman? You know those traditional American plays? I said, yeah, write me something like that. You have two months, write me 20 pages or you fail. Okay, bye. I'm like, uh, what? I took my ED money, because at that time they still give you ED money, and I went to then this store called Borders, which has now died and Barnes and Nobles. I took the ED money and being a good son of immigrants, I looked at the return policy and they said that if it's in good condition, you could return everything within 11 days. So I went to the play section, picked up two plays, read it on the 10th day, returned it, got a refund, kept doing it for a month, read eight to 10 plays. True story. I'm glad that got the biggest applause. Thank you. How do we scam the system? Excellent. Mashallah. Honest Muslims. Just skirt the edge. I wrote 20 pages. The, this play was called Domestic Crusaders. It's a day in the life of a Muslim Pakistani American family, three generations, the grandparents, the immigrant parents, and the three American born kids. I wrote it, I wrote it, I started for my 21st birthday. I finished it for my 23rd birthday. Upon graduating, I give it to him. He says, we're gonna do a stage reading. I'm like, what the hell is a stage reading? He goes, you're gonna get your community out there and you're gonna do this play in front of the community. My wife, Carla Blank, will direct it. And she was sitting there, she goes, I will? She goes, yeah, you'll do it. So then she came on, I don't know what I'm doing, I wrote this play. We go to Mehran restaurant. You guys know Mehran in Fremontistan? You could give Mehran an applause, and Chandni. I wrote the play, this is 2003, this is before Facebook, but there's still internets. I tell them, it's a true story. I tell them, I said, I have a play, but I know my people. This is 2003. They're not gonna support me, but if I give them food, they might come. And Ishmael Reed, who's African-American, said, first, get the validation of your community. Do this in front of your community. And I wanted my community to invest in our stories. I said, if I can get my community to come out and invest in storytelling, maybe they can invest in storytelling and art and culture and promote their kids to do this. Okay? You guys with me so far? 2003. So I go to Mar uh, Fayaz and Mehran. I say, hey, man, if you give me a buffet in this space, like, can you give it to me for, like, I don't know, like, 
eight bucks a head. And he goes, I'll give it to you for 10. So I go home to my father. I said, Fayaz gave it to me for 10. My father says, he said, what? $10? I'll go with you. My father goes with me, rolls up his sleeve. He goes, Fayaz, how much business have I given you? My son comes to you with a dinner theater experience and you charge him $10 a head. You will give him a five course meal, kheer and chai for $6 a head. And I got it for six dollars a head. I got it for six dollars a head. I use Chandni and Mehran as the audition places. I, I do a call out using, at that time, Evites. I don't know if people still use them. Uh, and listservs, there was no Facebook. I do it again and again and again. First people came to audition for the play just to laugh at me. Then they read the play and they're like, oh, I'll keep doing it. I finally cast the play with local people. If you get 50 people to a stage reading, it's a success. We got 350 people at Mehran. The capacity was 250. Don't ask me how we pulled it off. I asked my uncle, my blood, Mujahid uncle, I said, if I give you a dinner theater experience and a five course meal as your blood, will you come to my play for 20 bucks? He goes, if you make it 15, I'll think about it. <laughs> True story. So I did it for $10 a head. I gave food strategically during the intermission because I'm like, at least I get half a play. The test was whether or not they'll come after intermission. They all came, they gave it a standing ovation. Then we did it at the play at the Berkeley Repertory Theater. I did it myself. My mother made kana food, khima and dal for the staff. I made chai for everyone. I drove the U-Haul. I had to dress the set so we used our own furniture. My grandmother came home one day down the stairs. She goes, Beta, are we moving? Because everything was gone. I'm like, it'll come back after the weekend. It'll be fine. We did the play. We fast forward now, I, I went to UC Davis Law School. During the law school I did this play, I took a risk, a huge risk, because during your first year of law school you're supposed to do what? Intern for McKinsey. <laughs> Pete Buttigieg knows about that. Uh, you, I didn't do that, I did this play instead. I graduate law school, it's 2007, 2008, right, with, right when the economic recession hits, awesome. I'm not a lawyer, I'm supposed to get married. I move home broke. All right, I wake up every day with $5 in my wallet. I say, who keeps putting $5 in my wallet? My father says, beta, no man should be without $5. <laughs> and out of just pity, he used to put $5 in my wallet. I had to go get grocery for my mom. I'll translate from Urdu. She goes, beta, go get haradaniya, piaz, mirch, and tomato. Go get cilantro, tomato, and onions. And I'm like, I'm a grown man getting cilantro for my mother with $5 in my wallet, moving back into my high school home with a law degree license broke, unable to get a job. I wrote a play, What's Happened to My Life? This was 2008. Uh, there was a comment back there where all the really wealthy people come uh, before you at 4.30 p.m. Uh, remember that? We had the, where all the godfathers and godmothers came? Yeah, you, you, the very VIPs were there. If you're not there, don't worry about it. Uh, but someone asked me a question. He said, talk about the gatekeepers. And there were gatekeepers. I was, it was 2008. And I had this moment of realization, I was 28 years old. And if you're 28, you think you're gonna die by the age of 30. You have like a premature midlife crisis. So I was like, I'm single, I haven't been married. What have I done with my life? I'm gonna turn 30, I'm gonna die, it's over. I have to do something. I have to get this play out to New York. I can't get a job, I always wanted to be a writer. But you're not allowed to be a writer because there's only three professions, doctor, engineer, business, maybe lawyer, failure. Uh, and I'm like, I'm sitting here with this broken Fujitsu laptop. This was an old school Fujitsu laptop that was so old that when you used to turn it on, it used to make this noise. <sighs> like on life support. I didn't, even have, I didn't even have wireless. I had to attach a big yellow ethernet cable to it, right? And so there in frenzy, I used to spend the first six hours trying to get a job doing resumes. And the next six hours, I'm like, I should write. I have thoughts. Why can't I write? So I started writing articles. And I used to push them out there. One article got published. Two articles got published. Within six months, I published about 50 articles. Completely for free, I was broke. And then they started saying, I got a call from UC Berkeley, my alma mater, and said, can you give a presentation to journalists about this thing called the Twitter and the Facebook? This is 10 years ago. Because you're a social media journalist. I'm like, I am? They're like, you are. I'm like, I am. They said, yes. I'm like, I am. And then they said, we'll give you money. I'm like, real money? They said, yes. How much do you charge? I'm like, 
five hundred dollars? They're like, sure. I'm like, you're gonna give it to me? They said, yes. I'm like, okay. And that's how I became a social media journalist. True story. And the reason why, I'm, oh, thank you for the applause, the pity applause, I appreciate it. The reason why I mention all this is I literally had to bypass, I would say three gatekeepers. The first gatekeeper was my community. Because in 2003, when I started doing this play, I still remember an uncle came to me and said the following, Beta, this writing and play, useless. Why don't you do something useful? Like protest. I just wanna pin that right there. The first gatekeepers that many of us have to jump over are our own community who squash our dreams and hopes. I'm 39, I could tell you from the ages of 35 to 45, so many of my friends are what I call second-rate engineers and doctors and lawyers. They're doing well, they make six figures, but they're spiritually dead. The light has left their eyes because what they should have been is a politician or an activist or a lowly teacher Fakir, um, or an accountant or a writer. But once they told their parents to do it, their parents were like, uh, you could be an artist and you could eat my shoe. And they were just crushed. That's the first gatekeeper you have to pass over. The second gatekeeper I had to pass over was an establishment where people do not look like us. I have met the gatekeepers. It is a very white world. And they used to ask me, and they still say, how will your very ethnic story relate to the mainstream? Ethnic is code word for not white. Mainstream is code word for white. So I did everything myself from my broken Fujitsu laptop in Fremontistan, California with $5 in my wallet and pre-Facebook on the internet. And I invested in myself and I invested in my community to the point where in 2009, that same uncle who used to make fun of me when somehow we got our play to New York off Broadway for five weeks, he said, Beta, I've been in this country for 40 years. I have done everything right. I have raised children, I pay my taxes, my children became engineers and doctors, I turn on the television, and they only see me as a terrorist or a taxi cab driver. I made a mistake not making at least one of my children to a journalist. Right, you have my dua. So there you go. Thoughts can change. People can change. I'm done in five minutes. Am I st are you still with me? Yeah. All right, five minutes, I'm done. We fast forward. I got lucky. I married way up. I married a doctor. Uh, she got a job in Georgetown. I was stuck here in Fremontistan. Uh, eventually, uh, I, and this was, people don't know this. I was 31. People now know me a little bit. They're, I'm writing. I write for The Guardian, Huffington Post, The Play. And Muslims think like, oh, Ajahad, mashallah, he's... I saw him on TV, he must be wealthy. I had $600, completely broke. My 20s were also very interesting. I was completely broke. My wife, at that time, I literally told her, I said, I have no money. I'm giving you my mom's ring, because I have nothing else. My mom had met her one time before, and she said, she has my same, I'm gonna translate from Urdu. She has my same kaat, kaat means build. Maybe my ring will fit on her finger. So she gave me her ring. I said, maybe, you know, you're in DC, when I'm in DC, maybe you know, if there's an imam, you wanna just get married? And we kind of eloped, so I went to DC, we got married, I had $600 in my, in my account. No, I had $1,200, I'll tell you how I got to $600. I had $1,200, and I told my wife, I said, I promise, inshallah, inshallah, I'll make it rain, give me a year, I'll make it rain. Rain is a metaphor for money, right? I said, I don't know how, I'll make it rain. And she said, I'm investing not in who you will be, I'm investing in who you are, I have faith in you. So. There's a good story here. So yes, 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 this is good. Very rare, very rare. I moved to DC and I have $600. Why? Because I have to use $600 to move my Toyota Camry from Fremontistan to DC. My 97 Toyota Camry without a driver's door, door handle, which you had to make, into, you had to transform your fingers into a claw to open up the handle. Ishmael remembers this, he went to college with me. Um, and with the fun, fender was missing, that's all I had. I had that, I had one backpack and a few clothes. I moved to DC. I'm in DC, my wife's mashallah doctor. I thought I married a lottery doctor. I see her first paycheck, it was like something I won't say, but I thought, oh mashallah, we're getting this every two weeks. She goes, no, that's the monthly check. I'm like, what, what? She goes, yeah, I work at a clinic. I'm like, clinic? What do you mean? She goes, yeah, I'm a family health practitioner. I'm like, no! Like just tears came down my eyes because I married the poor doctor that actually wants to help people. Oh, the pain and the misery. 
the betrayal. So we moved into an apartment. I have no job. I have no idea what I'm going to do. And every day, just to give my wife like some comfort, I used to build a piece of Ikea furniture and present it to her. So used to, she used to come into the door. And I'm like, chest of drawers. She goes, mashallah, mashallah. And as I moved to DC, I got this phone call. And this phone calls from Al Jazeera. And Al Jazeera says, hey, we heard you moved to DC. We're starting a new channel called Al Jazeera America. We followed you on social media, seen your play. You came on our show one time. Would you be interested in being a co-host of our new show? Would you want to come and audition? And I literally said, well, I'm very busy making IKEA furniture right now. <laughs> and then they laughed, thinking I was joking. And I said, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> one week later, I go audition. Three months later, I'm live on television. And a week before I gave myself the deadline, before our one-year marriage anniversary, I got the first check. And I told my wife, I said, I see, I kept my promise. I'm telling you all this because a lot of people say, who am I? I can't do it. And if I can do it as a kid who spoke three words of English, I think you can do it as well. That's the main reason. And, you know, I've been very lucky. Some people say you're on CNN. I now am a CNN contributor. I write for the New York Times. I've been very lucky. In the 20s, I was so broke that I couldn't afford a plane ticket to L.A. You know how much a plane ticket cost to L.A.? $89. So I did this dua, this prayer to the universe. I said, Allah, just let me travel. I'll do whatever I can. And I remember I looked at my passport. I had to get extra pages in my passport because I have been invited, mashallah, all around the world. I don't pay. They feed me well. I did not write my law degree all around the world. I wrote my pen. That's the power of the pen. And I want to end on this note. I want to give you some examples, some homegrown examples. And I'll be finished. All right. The examples of Muslims who are succeeding at global scale using the power of the pen. Who's this? Hassan Minaj, your very own Hassan Minaj. I was here five years ago in Sacramento. True story, caravan. I'm speaking with Mehdi Hassan. Hassan's father, Najmi uncle's there. Uh, Hassan just comes to visit. Najmi uncle says, Beta, come here. That's my son, Hassan. Talk to him, tell him to go apply for the bar. Do it. This is five years ago, true story. I said, uncle, he'll be fine, he'll be fine. He goes, Beta, just enough, enough of this nonsense. So then Hassan's like, dad, not here, dad. So then I have to go five years ago and like literally be like, Hassan, bro, I'm gonna like, just, just, I have to do this for your father. Fast forward, Hassan stuck with it. Hassan Minaj, the son of Indian Muslim immigrants from Davis, California, is roasting the President of the United States of America from your community. Ambassador to Islam is his uncle, Islam Siddiqui. Give it up for an ambassador. Even though we have a Muslim ban, I find it hilarious that US taxpayer dollars are sending Islam across the world, literally. Ambassador to Islam. We also have Khizr Khan. People say, oh, those immigrant Muslims with their accents, don't put them on TV. I hate that. I hate that. If you have a compelling story and you have a compelling person, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor of this freaking state, okay? Have you, he can't even speak English. He's like, da, yeah, I'm the governor. Ah. Okay, if he can be the governor, your, your mom and dad, your grandfather and grandmother can be a protagonist of the American narrative. That's Khizr Khan. Ibtahaj Muhammad. The face of Nike. Check out this slogan. Be the hero you didn't have. Be the hero you didn't have. How many of us had this growing up? I just had Apu. And Apu doesn't even exist. All right? We have Rami Youssef. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What went wrong? No, she has her own Barbie doll, by the way. Check that out. Rami Youssef has his own show. He's an Egyptian-American Muslim. His whole show literally is about how to be an Egyptian American Muslim who fears God, but also like, you know, is single. <laughs> Leave it at that. The first episode is about not putting your foot in the sink. Everyone knows about the foot in the sink. Foot in the sink, ladies and gentlemen, has gone mainstream in America, mashallah, all right? One more example, Miss Marvel. The lady to the left is a Pakistani American superheroine, Kamala Khan, who has her own comic book series. Now, next year, she will have her own TV show on Disney Plus. The show is directed by a Muslim American director in her 20s. All right? We have Ilhan Umar, Rashida Tlaib, we have Keith Ellison, we have Malika Bilal, we have Sabrina Siddiqui, we have Mehdi Hassan. We also have this, this month's cover story. This is this month's cover story of The Wire. A black hijabi Muslim woman who is helping East African workers organize. The cover story is, 
Meet the immigrants who are taking on Amazon. How a group of Somalis became leaders in the fight to change a tech behemoth. Why can't we do it? And finally, I'll say this. A lot of kids ask me, who am I? I can't do anything. Five, four years ago, three students were killed in UNC. Dia, Yusur, and Razan. No media covered the story. Remember you telling that story how nobody covered it? No media covered the story. I was late, I was up awake at 2 a.m. I was working for Al Jazeera. Students, Muslim students in North Carolina went to Twitter. They did a hashtag Chapel Hill shooting. A local story became a national story, became an international story overnight thanks to Muslim American students. The brother of Dia was so smart, as he was processing the death of his brother, he decided to create an image. He said, I don't want my brother and his wife and his, uh, her sister to be seen as victims. I'm going to rebrand it R3 Winners. Fast forward, there's an R3 Winners Foundation that is dedicated to eliminating hate and bias. That was done by Muslim students. And finally, finally, are you guys with me still? Almost done? I'm finishing. Someone took this photo. My mom said this to me. She goes, this is recently. You guys, some of you know about my daughter. In April, my daughter, who was two, was diagnosed with stage four cancer, uh, hepatoblastoma. And she almost died in that month, but alhamdulillah, she survived. And it was all over her liver. So after doing some brutal chemo, in the summer, we needed a live living transplant. We got a live liver donor. The, the surgery was literally going to happen a few days later. And at the last second, as the donor is there in my home, the lead surgeon says, I don't want to go through with it because there might be some complications. So now we are desperate. We need a live living donor. Imagine asking someone with O blood type to give a piece of their liver so that my daughter could survive. I go on social media. I use Twitter. That's the only thing I have. I use the narrative. I use Facebook. And next thing you know, over 500 people I've never met donate and offer to be a live living donor for Nuseba. People who say the following to me, I have their messages saved. I hate everything you say on CNN. I hate all your politics. I hate seeing you on TV. But I am praying for your daughter. I am a conservative. I hate all of your politics, but I have applied to be a donor. And so my mom said, Beta, I think about it sometimes. And you know, I would have liked for you to become a doctor. Like in, if you were a doctor, you would have not amassed the social media reach. You would not have access to CNN. And maybe Nuseba would not be here with us today. So look at that, how things work out. And I'll end with this. I am tired of all of us saying, gosh, we had Rumi. We had Ghalib. We had Fez Ahmed Fez. We had Umm Khulthum. Weren't we great? Weren't Muslims amazing? And instead I want to say, where is the Rumi of Sacramento? Where is the Ghalib of Davis? Where is the Umm Khulthum of your community? And how come we're not investing in them? And I'm not going to tell my children, I have three kids, Ibrahim, Nuseba, and Khadija, you will be great victims. That's my legacy to you. You will suffer very well. So your job as a Muslim and as a person of color is to smile and just take it. Smile with your white teeth and be a doctor, engineer, and businesswoman, and get a nice six-figure salary, and stay in the suburbs and hide. And just hope that you could pass it through. I don't say that at all. I say, you're going to throw down in the ring. And you will be a hero of the American narrative. You are going to go for the appetizers. You're going to go for the fancy French cheeses I can't pronounce. You're going to go for the biscuits and the grapes. You're going to go for the main course meal. You're going to go for the desserts and the chai. I want you to go for everything. And I want you to bring your biryani and your hummus and put it next to the meatloaf. And I want you to expand the table. And then as Muslims, our jobs aren't finished yet. Once you make it to the table, inshallah, all our kids will, there will be another group that's getting beaten down like the Muslims. And then our job as Muslims is to look around reach down and grab that community and lift them up with us. And then they too can be the heroes of the American narrative. I refuse to gift my children an inheritance of victimhood. I refuse it. I'm done with it. I'm done with it. There's no reasons why our kids 
And our dadis and our dadas and our uncles and our moms cannot be the heroes of this American story, the co-protagonists of this narrative. And if you aren't writing your story, someone is always writing your story for you. But what do I know? I'm not a doctor. I'm not an engineer. I am not a dubious businessman with a factory. I'm just a lowly writer, a son of Pakistani immigrants who spoke three words of English, who had to go to ESL, who is left-handed, and now gets paid to wear makeup on TV. Thank you for your time. Assalamu alaikum.